Right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I'll be starting uh, today um, and I'll present some results from a project together with Raymond van Venetia and Rob Stevenson, our PhD supervisor, who are both in the virtual audience today. Um, and I must admit that this project focuses more on the theory of simultaneous space-time methods than on the massively parallel implementation of those. Uh, and if anything, I will try to make an argument against massively parallel implementations. Uh, uh, and instead, we'll try to refine the solution only where necessary and um, do the computations on a single machine, maybe with a couple of uh, cores. Um, still, I, yeah, I hope you find this interesting. Uh, I, I'm very excited to be here. Um, so why adaptivity reigns supreme? Uh, we, we consider the, the simplest possible parabolic problem being the heat equation just the initial value, uh, boundary value problem. So we have some spatial domain. This, in this instance, is the unit square. We have some time domain. And then given initial data and forcing data, we want to find the U that solves the heat equation. Now, if the U is smooth, if our solution is smooth, then the best piecewise linear approximation with respect to a uniform partition of, of the space-time cylinder into prisms uh, yields an an error that is proportional to uh, n to the minus 1 over 3, which is basically n to the minus 1 over d plus 1. Uh, in, in some Bogner space norm that we'll see uh, in a couple slides later. But if the, the solution is not smooth, for instance, if the uh, initial condition doesn't uh, adhere to the boundary conditions, then this error rate can be killed, well, uh, to, to almost nothing in in a in a uh, example that we'll see in a, a bit, it reduces to minus one over twelve, and this means that if you want to have a tenfold error reduction, you need ten to the twelve more degrees of freedom, which is absolutely insane, and and we're not going to even try to do this. However, we can recover this uniform rate using space-time adaptivity, and this is the goal for today. So as we all know, there there is a growing interest in space-time methods. Um, and apart from the memory consumption uh, versus time stepping, they, they are suitable for massively parallel implementations. Of course, that's basically the reason we're here today. They yield a solution for every time at once. And this uh, is natural when, when you're doing stuff that needs uh, the entire solution anyway, like PDE constraint, optimal control, or maybe data assimilation. Um, but also they can guarantee some quasi optimality of the approximate solutions that you get. And in, 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 uh, in this case, you can use it to get some adaptive routine that, that um, converges hopefully with optimal rates. And this will be our focus for my talk. So the standard space-time variational form that we'll see in the next slide, it yields a bilinear form that is not coercive. And this is problematic because if you want to have quasi-optimality of your solutions, you must somehow, I call it magically here, find the optimal test space. And uh, we are not magicians, so we do something else. Namely, we take the, the minimal residual petrov gelurkin discretization uh, from Roman Andreev from 2013, um, which relaxes these conditions to some inf -sub stability. And this is something that we can do uh, in our, in our uh, uh, previous paper, we showed these conditions for time slab FEM. Uh, and the, this, the word time slab is something that we've been hearing all week already. Um, but it, it, it smells a bit like Rota's method of lines um, in the sense that you allow non-uniform global time slabs in this case. Uh, and in every slab, you allow some spatial adaptivity, but you don't have the power to do fully local space-time refinement. And this is uh, problematic. Now, what you can do is build wavelets in space and time. Uh, and you can prove optimal rates with this. Uh, so Nikos Sekatsinos did this, and, and, and his thesis uh, is an interesting read, but this is difficult. And the next best thing to do is wavelets in time, finite elements in space. Um, and this is somewhat close to, to the result by uh, Neumuller and Smears, where they did a, a Fourier, uh, Fourier transformation in time uh, to build a time parallel, time parallel iterative solver for the implicit Euler scheme. 
uh, with parallel complexity, just logarithmic in a number of time steps. And that's, uh, I think, the best you can expect. Uh, and Ian gave a presentation on this, I think, two years ago. Uh, I wasn't there, but maybe some of you were. Uh, then there's also the result by Olaf Steinbach and Marco Zank, where in the case of homogeneous initial conditions, they find a coercive formulation uh, using some Hilbert-type transform on the test side. And then there is the, the paper by uh, Thomas Führer and Michael Karkulik from Chile, where they derive um, a well-posed fossils uh, 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 approximation without the use of dual norms. And this makes it very easy to use. You can just mesh the space-time cylinder, but you get a lower convergence rate for singular problems because they optimize for a stronger norm than the, the one that's natural for our uh, situation. All right, so this is the introduction. Let's dive into it. We have a simultaneous space-time variational form. Um, so let's consider some second order self-adjoint spatial operator, A of T. And if you have A of T equals minus Laplace, and then you just get the, um, the heat equation back, you have some domain in RD and you want to solve this equation. Now, to, to get a variational form, we, we define some operators, partial T, a and a functional G, and this allows us to uh, define a variational form being this one, and it is well posed on uh, on these two Bochner spaces. So, so on our test, sorry, on our trial side, we have the intersection of two Bochner spaces, and on the test side, we have another Bochner space, and this is well posed, so you can you can expect a, a unique solution for any uh, uh, suitable input. But the problem, as I alluded to before, is that this operator is non-coercive. And therefore, we can't do a simple Galerkin. So what Andreev did in, in 2013 was um, given some family of discrete subspaces, X delta, uh, formulate a minimal residual petrov galerkin method where we want to find U min that minimizes this uh, residual. And do note the dual norm here, which is uh, uh, problematic. Now, this is equivalent to solving the saddle point formulation. Um, and the solution you min that you, that you get if you were to solve this is optimal in the sense that you get the best approximation from your trial space. The problem is that this mu, this, this uh, auxiliary variable, is taken from the infinite uh, space y. And we cannot solve, we, we, cannot be, we cannot expect to solve this. So what we can do is um, define some, hope to have some uh, family of auxiliary uh, discrete subspaces that are uniformly inf substable. And this is the, the, the inf sub constant and you want it to be uniformly bounded away from, uh, from zero. And if you reformulate the previous, um, previous subtle point problem, on just y delta, then you get something that you can solve, actually. And actually, the solution, the, the second component of the solution, is quasi-optimal. And this, this is uh, one of the theorems in our previous article. So the goal now is to find these families, x delta and y delta, so that they are uniformly insubstable. Um, and in our previous paper, we, we considered a time slab fem where on the spatial side, we need a collection of subspaces O of H10, so that the L2 orthogonal projectors onto each subspace are uniformly H1 bounded. And this, this sounds a little bit scary, but it just means that the operator norm of these projectors are uniformly bounded by some gamma. So this is actually not very scary. Um, and what we then do is select a, a um, polynomial degree in, in, in space for every time slab and one of these spaces in the spatial direction, and we get a suitable uh, uh, family of discrete subspaces. Now you might ask, when, when, when is this actually true? Well, it basically works for the spaces you expect it to. So uh, we have a proof for locally refined fem spaces in 2D. Um, and in higher dimension, there is a proof for the quasi 
uniform finite element spaces, but uh, there's a good chance it works. It just works whenever you need it, to, basically. Um, right, so it allows us to do non-uniform time steps that are global, right? We can, we, can, we can differ the approximation space time step by time step. And uh, this makes parallelism very easy. But as I said before, we don't have a situation like this where we can refine towards one corner of the uh, space-time cylinder. And this is where the current research uh, uh, takes over. Um, we are going to do a tensor product approximation. So again, if we have one of those collections in the spatial direction and we have a, a wavelet basis in time, we call it sigma, that has these properties uh, in L2 and when you scale it also in H1, then we can show that there is inf sub stability, uniform inf sub stability for this tensor product space where we take a subset of, of wavelets in time and tensorize them with an entire uh, uh, um, discrete uh, fem mesh, let's say, in space. Okay, so if you um, these, these wavelets are available for piecewise linears. You can, uh, you can already go back to uh, 1998. And this basically amounts to a, a generalization to sparse grid approximation, which was uh, popularized by Bungartz and Gribo in, in 2004. And sparse grid approximation uses these tensor products of hierarchical bases to break the curse of dimensionality uh, at almost no loss of approximation rate. And we'll see in one second uh, why, why that is the case. But in our case, it allows us to do general space-time adaptivity with standard finite elements in the spatial axes and wavelets, the hard stuff, only in the temporal direction. All right, so this is a slide I, I didn't prepare myself. I found this online. Um, and what we see here is, is the, the, the basis in time, the hierarchical basis in time. And here we have a basis in space. And what we are going to do is take uh, uh, tensor products of these basis functions. And every rectangle is, is the support of one of these basis functions. And every dot is the center of one of those supports. And if we take a full tensor product, we take every tensor product, say everything here, um, then what we span is exactly the space of uh, the bilinear nodal basis. And this gives a picture that looks like this. And this is what we call full grid approximation. But if we take only the blue uh, basis functions and we leave out all of these, then we have a much smaller number of basis functions because we don't, you know, these are already 16, for instance, we leave those out but we lose almost no approximation power because the functions that we remove are highly oscillatory in both space and time at the same time. Um, uh, so under a little bit of regularity assumption on the, on the thing that you're trying to approximate, you can just leave these out and expect uh, similar uh, uh, approximation rates. And well, this is a visualization of one of those sparse grids. You might've seen it before. Um, we can also do this adaptively, um, and, and what we do is we select any subset of these uh, uh, rectangles that satisfies some nestedness in both directions. So if we take this one, then we also need its parent and this one and this one. Uh, it's called a downward closed set. But it allows us to make an adaptive approximation that's more refined to, in this case, towards the top right corner of the space-time cylinder. And this is exactly how we can drive an adaptive loop. Um, all right. So given some discretization delta, um, uh, assume that if we make an, uh, a uniform refinement, delta underscore, then the error is reduced by a constant factor zeta. This is the um, saturation assumption. If we have that, then we can build a, an X-stable splitting of this complement, meaning that this norm just uh, is equivalent. And with this stable splitting, we can build a residual error estimator. Um, so here you see the, 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 the residual of the true complement operator. We'll see in a little bit. 
um, the residual tested against this stable splitting, and this residual is efficient and reliable. So we, we can use it to drive an adaptive loop. Um, and one key ingredient for this is that if we select some uh, Durfler parameter theta and we uh, take a minimal subset of these, these uh, uh, splitting indices that catches a bulk of the error and then select a minimal refinement of our current uh, adaptive sparse grid, then we can drive the error down by some constant factor. Right, and the, um, the adaptive loop now is deceivingly simple. Um, we have four steps, solve, whoops, solve, estimate, mark, refine. Um, and this thing converges linearly in that in every step of the solution, in every step of the algorithm, the error is reduced at least with some constant factor. Um, in practice, we see better than linear convergence. We see, well, we see the optimal convergence, but um, at least this is what we can prove right now. All right, I, I gave myself an early exit, but I, I think I'm okay in time. Uh, so we'll discuss the, the, the solving at linear cost. So we have the sure complement equation here that we want to, uh, to solve with some right-hand side. Now, there are a couple of problems with solving this as opposed to a regular finite element uh, situation because Firstly, we have uh, an atypical temporal basis. We have those wavelets, which means that the, the matrices hidden inside these operators are mostly dense. Um, but still, using some, some, some unidirectional principle as splitting into upper and lower parts of the, of the temporal matrices, um, we can get a matrix vector multiplication in linear time. Um, and this, because uh, the, the operators involved are basically block diagonals across time. This stuff is easily parallelizable in time. And moreover, because we just have a, a, a regular finite element space in the spatial direction, we can use our off the shelf, whatever we have a, 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 a finite element package in space. Second problem, um, the A inverse here, it is, it is block diagonal because of uh, the, the basis that we have chosen, but it, every block is dense. Um, and in this case, we need to select the spectrally equivalent uh, preconditioner, let's say multigrid in space from your favorite fan package um, that can replace this. And the resulting sure complement is still symmetric and positive definite, so we can just use preconditions G. Um, but in this case, of course, the, the question is, what's the preconditioner? Uh, and the answer is that we can build an optimal preconditioner for this, uh, for this uh, uh, um, true complement that is moreover block diagonal. So that's pretty cool. Um, and this diagonalization in time, again, uses these RIS properties that we are L2, RIS uh, uh, for L2 and after scaling RIS in H1. Um, and in the spatial directions, we need a standard symmetric multigrid uh, solver. All right, so now we, we found two things. We found a way to apply our solution in linear cost, and we found an optimal preconditioner. So we can solve at optimal cost. Um, and in theory, uh, the, the parallelization through time of this idea should be very easy because all these things are block diagonal. Um, and this is thanks to the wavelet basis. So we did some testing with, with uh, uh, parallelism in the same, uh, uh, on the same machine shared memory, uh, and these looked okay. Uh, we haven't taken the time yet to do some massively parallel stuff. Um, so that may be something for next year. In any case, let's look at some numerical results. So we again consider the heat equation on the uh, unit square. This is no, no difficulty. We can do anything we like. Piecewise linears. If the solution is smooth, then the full grid, the, the uniform rate is um, order n to the minus one over three, which as I said before, amounts to n over minus one over d plus one. And the hallmark of these sparse grids is that you can solve these time dependent things as if they were stationary. So we have a rate of minus one over d in this case. Um, and because of the, the, because the, the solution is 
uh, smooth, we can't really expect to get better performance using adaptivity. But if the solution is uh, singular, because for instance, in this case, the, um, the, the initial condition is one, but we impose, oh man, this is terrible. This is a very terrible drawing. So we have the space-time cylinder here, the time axis here. Um, the solution should adhere to the boundary conditions, but the initial condition doesn't. Um, the initial data doesn't. So you get very, very high space-time refinement in, into, these, uh, edges, into these edges, and this scales the full and sparse grid rates completely uh, to, to 1 over 12, but the adaptive loop recovers this rate of 1 over 3, which is uh, quite cool. Um, okay, so we built the first proof of concept uh, 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 implementation and it shows that indeed we have a linear dependence on, on the number of degrees of freedom for a single solve step uh, and also a linear number of uh, and, and linear um, memory uh, although, because we are using these sparse grids, the code gets pretty complex and therefore we get, you know, the, the soft steps are not very fast yet. And also the memory overhead is quite large, um, but these are, I think, at least this one, I think you should be able to fix by parallelism. Um, and this is just a, a proof of concept code, so we don't have any scaling results yet, I think. Um, this is now my last slide, so what did we do? We looked at a space-time variational form for parabolic equations, and we found that the wavelets in time, finite elements in space, this discrete uh, family of spaces, are suitable for space-time adaptivity. We then built an adaptive algorithm that shows linear convergence, or we could prove linear convergence. And then we hinted that some wavelet basis allows us to solve these systems in linear cost. And we actually saw that this happens in practice too. And um, this stuff should be easily parallelizable in time. Now, our future directions, firstly, we'd like to extend the theory, not just to basically the heat equation, but maybe uh, some, some uh, uh, other equations too. We'd like to show optimal convergence of this algorithm and not just linear convergence, um, but that may be uh, difficult to do. Then an idea uh, we, we got actually yesterday is we should investigate the parallel complexity of this solve uh, operation because we could easily parallelize this in, in, uh, in time. And uh, given a little bit of, uh, of time, we should, I think, play around with this idea to, to parallelize into uh, some large scale setting. And I think that is it for me. Here are some references. <laughs>